My name is Stephen King. I am the Director of Clinical Quality for the Health First Medical Group. It is my privilege to welcome you here tonight for AIDIT training, it's communication training objectives. Tonight, I want to make sure that everybody here understands your role in transforming our patient experience for the Health First Medical Group. We're going to talk about a way to implement standardized scripting so that you can have a better framework for communication. We're going to also learn to solve common challenges that are related to the patient experience. I know you're coming on in. Don't worry. We're going to call on you first in the question and answer, so come on in. We're going to develop some skills tonight through some videos and some exercises. We're going to show you an audit tool that we're going to demonstrate for this. But particularly, I want you to build your understanding and appreciation of the program that we're about to employ. So let's do a little bit of housekeeping. All of you are adults. <clears throat> Make sure you take your phone and silence it right now and stick it away if you have a purse or a pocket. You're not going to need it for a couple hours. I have some managers that are going to be roving to make sure you don't play on your phone. Secondly, there is a sign-in sheet, one in the back corner, one in the front corner. Hey, front corner person, you, right over there. Yes, is there a sign-in sheet over there? Yes. Find your name and sign in and pass it along. Make sure you sign in on one of these sign-in sheets. Question, do you need to sign in on both? Answer, no. Sign in on one of the sign-in sheets. If you're here and you've scheduled with someone else and changed and your baby's daddy ate your horse or whatever happened and you're here tonight and you're, here, you're supposed to be here another time, write your name on the sign-in sheet and sign and everything will be good to go. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to the AIDIT Zone. You're traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound but of mind, a journey through a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Aided Zone. Respectfully submitted for your perusal. It's Friday night in your local emergency department. Everyone's busy. And for her one nurse ratchet, her shift has left her tired and seemingly uncaring. In an environment where compassion is supposed to be the norm, Nurse Ratchet has found herself drifting farther and farther away from the aided zone. Who are you? I'm your nurse and I need to get this but, cleaned up. But I haven't even seen the doctor yet. Never mind that. He'll but, be in when he gets a you're, chance. You're and you need to sit still so no, I can I, do my job. I want to see the doctors. You need to sit still and quit asking questions. You're hurting me. <sighs> Stop. <sighs> Oh, you're bleeding all over the place. Yeah, well, oh, oh, I can't God, deal with stop this. It. What's your problem? Oh. I have to go see another patient oh. now. What about my hand? Nurse! Come, come back! back. Nurse. Nurse! You've just witnessed a dichotomy of care, executed flawlessly and without reservation. Without knowing it, a one nurse ratchet has left many questions, questions that, if answered, might alleviate much of the uncertainty that her patients feel as they are taken further and further away from the aided zone. Oh, ma'am, what are you doing? What is, what's wrong with me? I need you to hold Am I still. Okay? The doctor will be in to explain everything in a little bit. I have to get an IV and get some blood work. What's going on with me? Can you hold still, please? Am I okay? What's in that bottle? What do those squiggly lines mean? I can't get the IV started. It's the end of my shift. I have to go. Wait! Someone else will be in to start your IV. I'm out of here. Please! Somebody help me! Please help! Hey, Ann. It's been a horrible night. The guy on bed four still needs blood work and an IV. He's all worked up about it. Be ready for some real drama. Ugh, oh, I'm out of here. Please, somebody help me. Please. Oh my gosh. How come nobody will tell me what's going on? It is absent. The fear of the unknown can play tricks on the mind. What else could go wrong today? Hey, you stupid driver! Really? I'm getting pulled over?
cannot believe I'm getting pulled over. What else could go wrong today? Good afternoon, ma'am. My name's Officer Friday. I stopped you for your erratic driving. May I see your driver's license, please? I'm really sorry, officer. I've had a horrible day at work. I just got a little frazzled, I guess. Okay. Uh, just a couple questions. Uh, first off is, is this your correct... Ma'am, is this your correct address? This no, you're, you're, you're hurting me. <sighs> yes, that is. Is there a reason why you were driving erratic? Are you having a, a bad day? I, I just got a little frazzled, I guess. Okay. Well, you realize you can't have a bad attitude when you're driving. I, okay? I, I'm aware right. of that, sir. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to issue a citation. Um, I'm in a good mood today, so actually if I issue the one citation, I'd like you to go to the courthouse immediately and get it taken care of. Can you do that for me? Oh, I Can will. Can you do I, that? I promise. Okay. Yes, I will. So it is very important that you tell the judge exactly what happened. All right, and go from there. Okay. So take this to the judge, to the courthouse immediately. Thank you. Okay, I will. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Okay, have a good day, ma'am. Thank you. Nurse Ratchet, you are here in the matter of several violations. Your Honor, several violations? I was just given one. Just one. It says right here. Nurse Ratchet, you are in violation of the following. Not acknowledging your patients. You mean I didn't greet you with a smile? Not introducing yourself to your patients. I didn't introduce myself or tell you who I was? Not letting your patients know how long it might take to help them. Um, I didn't? When asked simple questions, you never gave an explanation to the patient. Who, what do those squiggly lines mean? And finally, you didn't have the courtesy to thank your patients for letting you take care of them. What do you have to say for yourself? I I thought, I thought... Ma'am, I don't know what to say, except you are in violation of all the basic rules of taking good care of your patients. Your sentencing date will be June 6th. Next! Gün dolandı dalı taşı Dinliyor gözümün yaşı Aa, Gelin eyle tezgünde Hi Miss Ratchet, my name is Marie. I'll be the nurse taking care of you today. Put up on that pillow, and the doctor should be in in about 10 minutes. And we'll get probably an x ray that will take about a half hour to get the results. How could I have not treated my patients better? Well, why don't Please, I have time for this? Come on. I have a oh, to go. It's the end of my shift, and I didn't give it the doctor order. Wait, is someone else going to come in and take care of me? Oh. Is there anything else I can do for you today? No, I feel so safe in your care. Thank you. You're so wonderful. Oh, you're more than welcome. And thank you for choosing Mercy. Thank you very much. A simple request. Acknowledge your patients and their families. Introduce yourself. Let them know the duration of their care. Explain what will be happening next and answer any questions and thank them for allowing you to care for them. By doing this, you too will find yourself moving closer and closer to the aided zone. Admittedly a little cheesy, but I think everybody gets the point, right? 
what goes around comes around. Never forget that when it comes to customer experience. Take a look at this quote that's on the screen. The easiest way to turn a service into an experience is to provide a poor service, thus creating a memorable encounter of the most unpleasant kind. Let me ask you a question. Do you think this person had a good restaurant experience? I don't think whoever went into this restaurant is ever going to plan to go back to that restaurant. It matters. Let me translate this for you in healthcare. If you've been involved in healthcare for any length of time, a day, a month, a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, etc., I hope that you came into it because you want to help people. I hope that is your burning desire. But medicine is shifting for all of us. In the old world, it used to be what's known as fee for service. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But what is becoming more and more important in the delivery of care is the patient's experience of their care, the patient's perception of their care. The federal government, in fact, is going to start tying reimbursement to this, and that's the reason we're going to talk about aid it tonight. I want you to think about this whole idea of patient satisfaction. How many in this room has ever filled out a survey of any kind? I'm sure that's everybody. And as you probably know, you've heard of patient satisfaction. Maybe you've heard of our survey vendor, Press Ganey. Maybe you've even heard of CG Caps, the actual survey that we use to measure patient satisfaction. But what goes into this idea of patient satisfaction? What is the patient actually thinking about when they come to care? Let me, let me back up and ask it this way. When do you think a patient starts forming their impression of the care that they're going to receive? Yell out something to me. When they walk in the door, okay, that's good. But I bet it even starts before that. On the phone, when a patient goes to make an appointment, they start forming a perception of the care that they're going to receive. Then that patient, you know, you call somebody, and we've all dealt with those people. I've dealt with those people at Health First. I'm sure you have. That it's obvious they don't want to be at work today, and they don't want to help anybody. Raise your hand if you can identify with what I'm talking about. Wow, okay. A lot of dishonest people in the room. <coughs> But the point is, is that care, the perception of care starts with the phone call, just to get an appointment. And then when somebody rolls up to one of our clinics or one of our ancillary clinics, radiology, lab, whatever, they start forming a different impression. Who do you think is the most important person for first impression when they walk through the door? Who? Reception is the most important person when they walk through the door. It just compounds this idea of patient satisfaction, the anticipation of the care that they're going to get. This is what patient satisfaction is. Patient satisfaction is the difference between what a customer expects to get and what a customer perceives he gets. A lot of what we're talking about tonight, the stuff that we want to do better at Health First Medical Group, deals directly with patient perception. Does it always mean that they're correct? No. But perception is reality. So we live in what's known as a service imperative. The fewer contacts that we have with the people of an organization, the more important the quality of each contact becomes. That means we're all in it together, everybody, from the first person that answers the phone to the registration person, to the scheduler, to the coder, to the clinician, to the MA, to the LPN, the RN, whatever you are in this room, you play a part in this idea of patient experience. And the reason why it's becoming more important is that the federal government has caught on. Medicine is changing from the way it's always been to a whole new era where reimbursement is actually going to be tied to some of our patient satisfaction scores. This already occurs in the hospital. It's also going to start impacting the ambulatory world. So if you hear anything tonight, hear this. Every day, we expect you to come to work and work at the top of your competence the top of your license, the top of your certification, whatever you are. If you're an MA, be the best MA you can be. Nurse, doctor, provider, lab person, rad person, it doesn't matter. Be the absolute best person you can be. That is expected because failure there generally means goodbye to your job. What we're asking you to think about is the ways that we can start changing our patients desire for experience within the company. We're, we're wanting you to think a little more clearly about patient satisfaction and the role that your communication can have in it. So let's take a look at what it might look like when a patient comes in and has a bad first experience. 
Good morning. Who are you and why are you here? My name is Bridget Cunningham. I'm here to see Dr. Gerard. I just found out I'm pregnant. I'm so excited. What do you do? Half the people in here are pregnant. It's an OBGYN. Well, I'm sorry. I, it's just our first and we're just so excited. Great. Fill those out. Oh, um, I don't understand what this means. What, what is that? I'm not a doctor. If I was, I wouldn't be sitting here. Um, well, do you think it's going to be a long time? Because I don't feel very well. They'll get to you when it's your turn. And if you feel like you're going to puke, you'll sit over there by the trash can because I really do not do puke well. Really? Yes. <sighs> you ever had a bad experience in a medical office? Raise your hand. As a patient. Oh, I have. Now, I should tell you that every video that we're showing you tonight, we actually gleaned from actual comments that we get back from our Press Ganey surveys. Whether or not you realize it or not, we have a lot of people that fill out those surveys, and then when they have the opportunity to give us comments, they are not shy. They will quote people's names. This receptionist named this, the nurse named that, did this or didn't, good and bad, and you're going to see some of them. But that's why all throughout tonight, think of it this way. We're talking about being customer and patient focused. That's what we need to be. We exist to take care of customers. We have about 495,000 people in Brevard County. It's only going to get bigger as Vieira grows. We're going to have a lot of people looking for care. We always need to make sure that we stay patient focused because patients don't have to come to Health First. Health First has the largest health care footprint in Brevard County, but they have other options. We don't want them to go to our competitors. We want them to come to us. We need to make sure that every time we interact with somebody, we're adding value to their life, the service that we're giving them, or we're going the extra mile. So interpersonal interactions, from the moment you start talking to somebody or they're checking in, they're late, they're harried or whatever, are forming lasting perceptions and judgments about our organization. High quality interactions, therefore, are critical. By a raise of hands, do you think anybody actually gets up in the morning with nothing better to do and says, you know what, today I think I'll go visit the doctor? Anybody here ever felt that way? Nobody feels that way. People come to us in the clinics or wherever because either they're broken or they feel like they're broken and they're scared. They want some answers. They certainly don't want bad news. They want to come in, get a clean bell of health, and go on about their business. So nobody's looking to come to health care just because. They're coming because something's wrong. Always, always, when you have a customer in front of you, make sure you go the extra mile. Now I'm going to step on some toes. Because all I have spoken about so far is our external customer, the patient. We also have internal customers. Who do you think our internal customers are? Us. Us, the way we treat each other on the phone, in our interactions, via email, could use a bump. Raise your hand if you've ever had a discourteous service from a fellow employee at Health First. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Means we've got a long way to go. Let's think about it this way. You know, Disney actually does a really, really good job when you go to any of their theme parks because they don't call their associates employees. Does anybody know what they're called? They're called cast members for a reason because from day one of your training, they inculcate in you that everything that you do is like theater behavior. You're either on stage or off stage. On stage behavior is stuff that is directly observed by a customer. You should always act accordingly. So if you're having a bad day or the child uh, payment is late or you can't pay your light bill or God forbid something happened again to the EMR, those are not the conversations <laughs> that we have in front of our customers. That's called on stage behavior. If you get into a riff with one of your fellow employees and you really just need to go in the break room and duke it out, don't hit each other, go in there and do it verbally, off stage behavior. Always when you are viewed by external customers, your behavior is considered on stage behavior. Always act accordingly. I'm sorry, let me set this up differently. Let's see now, let's continue this bad visit and see what it might be like to have a bad run in with a nurse. Bridgetta, Bridgetta. Did you mean Bridget? Bridget Cunningham? Yes. Bridget. What's wrong with you? 
I'm not feeling so well. I'm pregnant. Oh, well, come on with me then. Come on. If you'll come with me and step up on those scales. Okay, just so you know, we're going to be monitoring your blood pressure during pregnancy. Was my weight okay? Yeah, your weight's okay, but we monitor everybody's weight during pregnancy. Pregnant people just think they can eat whatever they want. So now if you'll have a seat here in the chair, I'm going to get your blood pressure. Sometimes when I get nervous, my blood pressure goes up. I'm a little nervous right now. Oh, well, that's something you need to talk with the doctor about. Well, Not me, really. Something you need to talk to him about. But don't you need to write it down? Well, I can write it down, but it's really something you need to tell the doctor. Oh, okay. Now let me get your blood pressure. Oh, my well, phone's vibrating. Let um, me see who that is. It's a little tight. Just a second. But let it's me hurting see who my this arm. is. Um, can be important. But... But this is Hi. important. You're hurting my arm. Yeah, I can Hello? be ready at five o'clock. Just be right outside, and I'll be right. Just You're this patient is, is waving their hands at me. Arm. Just be there at five o'clock, and I'll be right uh, outside the door. Hello. I gotta go. Okay. See you at five. Okay. Um, okay. Now let's no, get your wait, blood pressure. Wait, wait, wait. Do you think you can wash your hands? You've been touching your nose, and I, I'm a little bit of a germaphobe. Oh, are you one of those? Okay, by all means, let me get my hands all cleaned up for you. I'm going to reach across you right here and get a little bit of sanitizer and get my hands all clean. Now, can we proceed? Yes. All right, let's get your blood pressure then. All right, your blood pressure is 128 over 82. I'm not surprised. All right, now let me get your pulse. Your pulse is 78. What I'd like for you to do now is put that gown on, and the doctor will be in here in just a minute. Ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, this isn't a gown. It's a sheet. What am I supposed to do with this? Everything that we've done, all of these videos, have, been, have come from actual comments. I shudder to think somebody actually answered their phone while caring for a patient or rubbed their nose and decided not to wash their hands. But you know what? We get a lot of comments from Press Ganey that nurses and doctors do not wash their hands. So don't be afraid or don't be shy if somebody says, hey, you need to wash your hands. I've already talked about some of this. The reason why we are introducing ADET as a communication framework is because our patients really do have a choice. They don't have to come to us. We want more patients to come to us because it, we live in a very competitive market. And you jump to the last bullet, it has a tremendous financial impact to our organization and helps us be ahead of the competition if we get this whole idea of the service imperative. So if you've done any reading about healthcare, and if you haven't, I suggest that you do. We're moving away from what's known as fee for service to fee for quality. In the old days, it used to be the more money you want to make in healthcare, see more patients, bill more services, send them for more tests, et cetera, blah, 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 and everybody's happy because we're floating a bunch of money. That day is gone. The federal government has said, we're not just going to pay you to do things. We want you to move the needle. We want people to have good clinical quality outcomes, but we also want them to have a good experience. So the federal government takes a patient's perception of their care very, very seriously. Something to always keep in mind. So we stewed on this. We thought about it. We, when we started reading the literature that this was coming, we thought, how can we make a deliberate attempt to make sure that people understand we are evaluating this? We're taking people's experience seriously. That's what got us into the survey business in May of 2013 to start administering these surveys. So we did for a while, trying to work the kinks out, trying to understand the situation, trying to have reactions from some of our providers. But we decided to start looking at some of the comments. 
So just to give you an example, and like I said, people do turn in comments, this graph merely represents from January to March of 2014, so before we rolled out group management, before we combined our EMRs, we had 6,000 comments, many of which were positive. So we're doing a good job. You're going to see some of that. But there are some opportunities for improvement. There are some negative comments. And when you look at those comments uh, where people actually have concerns, they all kind of boil down to the stuff that you might guess. Takes too long, can't get in, no one follows up with me. Those are the comments that people want to give us. So now let's pull back the curtain and I'll let you meet the wizard. And we'll take a look at some of these comments that I actually pulled from the Prescani database last month. Look at this, we get some positive ones. Of all the doctors in their offices I've seen in my life, no one in any state in which I have ever lived has come anywhere near to the degree of knowledge, thoroughness, communication skills, caring and compassion that I have received from Dr. Weldon. See, they name people out. <clears throat> and his entire staff. In addition to Dr. Weldon himself, let me single out Joy and LPN and Tammy, a scheduling secretary for special thanks to all superb, cannot say enough good things about them. That's awesome. I don't know if those people are here tonight. Yeah, hey, we need to celebrate success. I'm sorry as I point my finger right at you. We need to celebrate success. Uh, but then again, we also see some, some negative comments. Look at this. Just wanted to mention again the problem with the front desk receptionist. They are so rude in every department. People will walk by and ignore you. I feel, here's that perception, they are the reason wait times are so long. Now, are the receptionists the reason wait times are long? No. No, it's, it's clinician backup. We understand what's going on. Patient perception. I do understand there is work to be done, but most of the time I catch these incompetent workers gossiping. We get all kinds of comments about people being on phones. Sometimes people think we're not watching or we don't know, but our patients are watching. you got to make sure you know that. Every time you're facing a patient, any type of external customer, it's on stage behavior. People are writing down names. People will actually call back and say, you know, who was the secretary that was on Monday at 3 o'clock? So they make sure they write it down correctly when they send in their comment. Here's another one. From my arrival to leaving the clinic took over one hour. I accept Dr. Fortis is very busy, but I sat in the consulting room for 45 minutes following blood pressure and pulse checks no, before seeing anyone again. No one came in to apologize for the delay until Dr. Fortis arrived and he apologized for the long wait. Does it take any more amount of time to go by and say, hey, you're not forgotten? We're going to get you back in this room very quickly. It, it just gives us a lot of gain with the patient. When we set them somewhere and we forget about them, believe me, the clock is ticking. They're timing things. I have received comments where they've dialed it down to the minute. I waited for 98 minutes, and that's not acceptable. And what can I say? I, you're absolutely right. Then I have to go and figure out what happened. Every occasion I call the office, I'm put on hold and can wait up to 15 minutes. Wait times can be excessive. 45 minutes past the appointment time. Scheduling appointments has been somewhat difficult to meet needs. Two to three weeks out sometimes from a PCP's patient. You know, think of our patients the way you want to be treated. If you have an appointment at 3 o'clock and you're a good person and you show up five minutes till your appointment, are you very generous to the person that tells you, hey, I'm sorry, doctor's running a little late. It's going to be about another 35 minutes before we can get you back. Do you jump for joy and see rainbows in your head? No. You start looking at your watch and texting somebody and go, I can't believe this. This is 35 minutes. That's what you start doing. That's what they start doing. So always keep that in mind. So the, anything that we can do to allay this misperception is what we need to do. We also get some very funny ones. From Dr. Kondo's patient, they're great, and that nurse takes off that three pounds for my clothing, contents, and shoes. I'm assuming this is a female patient. You can run with that if you want to. Would recommend this office to anyone, even the Pope. Actual comment from one of Dr. Fadigan's patients. I love this Dr. Canalopoulos. If you look at his name, that's the way you spell it on the slide. And she said, God knows how to spell it, but he is a wonderful doctor. Now, you know, we've done four sessions of this AIDIT training tonight, but we've not rolled this stuff out to our provider base. How many here knows that our providers need some help with some communication, some of them? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have a plan for them. It's coming. So let's, <laughs> let's take a look at 
that visit that you saw with a negative receptionist and a negative nurse and extend it to what it might look like with a negative provider. What am I supposed to do with this? Oh my gosh, this is, this is ridiculous. Oh. All right, so it says you have a, a foul odor and you think you might have an infection. No, no, whoa, 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 wait, no. I'm pregnant. I don't have any of those problems. Mm, what's your name? Bridget Cunningham. Wrong chart. Oops. Great. Which is great. Yes, you're here because you're pregnant. Do you have any other health issues? Uh, well, my blood pressure sometimes goes up when I'm nervous. All right. Um, what we're going to do next is we're going to need to do an ultrasound and then uh, do some blood work. So um, just wait well, here and my nurse will be back with well, you shortly. What about my exam? Not until after you have your tests well, done. Well, then why did I get undressed? You know what? My nurse will answer your questions. But, but doctor, I, ha I have some more questions. <sighs> we, get, we get reports all the time, patient's perception. Doctor was in the room for three minutes and left. Didn't answer any of my questions. If you know that doctor, please don't raise your hand. Look at this quote on the screen. Edwards Deming is known as the father of medical quality and made the quote that variation is the enemy of quality. Variation. Meaning that when everybody does something any old way, quality reduces. So if you ever want to ensure that you've got more quality, you standardize where possible. That's the whole idea. That's the reason why we're going to look at ADA. We're going to get into some of these communication frameworks. It's not going to be rocket science. You're not going to look at it and say, wow, the heavens have parted, and I've got this sudden burst. No, you'll say, this is common sense, and you're right. But people don't do it all the time. Variation is the enemy of quality because when our patients come to us, they're usually pretty nervous, as I've already indicated. No one goes and sees the doctor because they want to. They go and see a doctor because they have to. They're nervous and anxious. They're feeling vulnerable. We're hoping by standardizing some of our communications, scripting that we're going to reduce variation. We're going to help our patients' anxiety level decrease a little bit. When patients are less anxious, they generally are more compliant, which means they do what we tell them to do. Hey, why don't you stop smoking? Why don't you eat better? Why don't you exercise? And if they do that and they follow their medication regimen, then their clinical outcomes improve. And if all of those things are happening, typically someone's satisfaction level is a lot higher with the care that they're receiving. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to eliminate as much as we can from the variability of communication. And it'll, it'll become more clear to you in a little bit. That's why we're adapting ADIT at Health First. It gives us a framework for communication, whether you're talking to patients, family members, internal customers, it doesn't matter, to help reduce variability, and it's going to allow you as a healthcare worker to share your professional knowledge, special training, and like I said, it's not rocket science, it's you, but you're going to begin to look at communicating with a patient in just a little different way, how important it is to communicate with patients. This is AIDIT, the AIDIT communication framework. This is also in your book. I hope everybody has a book. Go ahead, follow along, doodle. That's the way I got through college, make all kinds of notes, keep it legal and sane and, and nice. But this is AIDIT. AIDIT is an acronym that simply stands for Acknowledge, Introduce, Duration, Explanation, and Thank You. And as we go through this, the two that are going to be the most discordant with you are going to be the ideas of introducing, the way we're going to talk about it, and saying thank you. Those are going to be the two that you're going to say, hmm, it's going to be a little uncomfortable, maybe in some of the role playing that you get to do at your table in a little bit. But with the introduction of ADIT, let's see if we can change that patient's experience with the receptionist if a receptionist does the principles of ADIT. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, I'm Kathy. How can I help you? Hi, Kathy. My name's Bridget Cunningham. I'm here to see Dr. Gerard. Oh, yes, it does say that you're a new patient. Is that correct? Yes, I just found out I'm pregnant. I'm so excited. Oh, congratulations. That is wonderful. I just need to see your ID and your insurance card just to make copies. Sure. There you go. Thank you. And I have some new patient paperwork the doctor would like you to fill out. It's about your medical history, and also there's forms regarding privacy and confidentiality. If you'll go ahead and fill those out while I make copies. Sure. Here you go. 
Um, is the doctor running on time? Actually, he's running about 10 minutes behind. He delivered a baby this morning. And, but I will let the nurse know that you're here, and that way she'll, you know, go ahead, be able to go ahead and take you back. But if you'd like, you could have a seat and finish filling out the paperwork. Okay, do you think he'll have time to answer my questions? All, yes, he will have plenty of time to answer all your questions. And if you have any questions for me, just let me know. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Let me introduce you to the actress that learned the Ada here, <laughs> Kathy Boatwright back here in the back. Give it up for my actress that actually learned the principles. Thank you. You know, what I didn't point out in the first one, maybe you remember, sitting there, the receptionist actually had on a hoodie, which is kind of universal for, I think I'm a thug at work, and I don't really want to deal with people. Actual comment that came in, for a department, for a clinic, that the front staff all wore hoodies. I think we've got that one corrected. Not good customer-facing experience. When you're out in the public and you want to be representing the thug life, wear hoodies to your heart's content. Don't wear them in the clinic. Now, why don't you turn to page three, because I'm going to show you another little video, because I want you to think about it. This is where you get to have a little participation. As this video plays, I want you to be thinking about these questions. How can this model of AIDIT actually work at Health First? Is there a way that we can optimize the use of the EMR so that we enhance the patient experience? And is there any possible way we can do this without sounding robotic? God forbid that we post AIDIT posters in the workplace so that you have to look at and remind yourself to acknowledge a patient when they're standing in front of you, or wait a minute, I have to tell you how long this is going to be. We don't want that. We don't want it to sound robotic. We don't want to go back to that kind of stuff. So as you watch this video, keep these questions in mind. Jot down some notes. Ada began at Holy Cross Hospital on the south side of Chicago in 1993. It began when a physician we had recruited, Dr. Evelyn Diaz, joined our staff and she was with us for about three weeks and she came to us very frustrated and said, I no longer want to be a part of your team. And we asked Dr. Diaz why and she said, if we couldn't take care of our patients your patients any better than we do, then I don't want to be your partner. I spent my whole life becoming a doctor, and I truly want my patients to be treated well. Uh, with that information, we asked Dr. Diaz if she would just give us a chance, and I met with about 150 employees. And I think this is what's exciting about AIDED. It was truly created by the employees. And as we all got together, I asked them to think about if it was our families we were taking care of, our friends, our neighbors, what kind of experience did we want that to become? And uh, we struggled for several hours, and when it was all said and done, they wanted to create AIDED, which was the five fundamentals of service. A is acknowledgement, that means we want to have a great eye contact, whether that person is a customer that you're seeing in front of you or it's somebody that you're talking to on the phone, we want to let them know that they are the most important part of our interaction and that we genuinely care about them. I is the ability to introduce yourself and what role you're going to provide in that care to manage up and let people know that you're in very good hands. The average inpatient that's in the hospital for four days comes in contact anywhere between 60 and 70 employees. That's a lot of people coming in and out of your lives. The gift we want to give our patients is that they're in very caring, loving hands. And by taking the time to introduce ourselves and to uh, share our experience experience, it helps the, our patients and their families to feel confident in the person taking care of them. The third thing we look to do is duration. We know that in setting time expectations is very important to patients. And let me give you an example. My son, who is 16 years old, uh, plays baseball. And when he got hit by a pitch, he went to the ED. And as we were sitting in the ED, the doctor had said that since he got hit in the head, he's going to need to have a CAT scan. So as we were waiting in the waiting room, the nurse came up to us and said, Mr. Dean, I want to 
apologize ahead of time. We have three patients that are ahead of you, and it's going to be at least an hour and a half to two hours before we can get your son in for a CT, and we truly think he needs that, uh, so I apologize. Now, I could have sat out there and, and been waiting and frustrated. If, I'm sure if no one came up to me and told me, I'd be wondering, did they forget about me? Do they know why I'm here? What, why, do I, why do I need to have uh, this test anyhow? And maybe I would have voted with my feet. Maybe I would have got mad and even laughed. But by her coming out and, and reducing my anxiety and letting me know that, uh, that we're going to get to you just as soon as we can, I was fine with the wait. So time expectation was the third part of ADIT that we, we believe important. The fourth is explanation. We found that uh, with so many people going in and out of our patients' lives, every patient has a right to know who you are and what role you're going to provide in that care. So we trained hard to have each of our employees begin to explain what it was they're going to do before we did it. T stands for thank you. We want to be able to not only thank people when they come to us for uh, a test or a procedure, we also want to thank them for trusting us. We know that patients are very anxious. My mom is uh, 75 years old and she still gets the Reader's Digest. In the Reader's Digest, one of the headlines were 14 ways to survive your hospital stay. So we recognize that when patients come to us, it's a time in their life when things may be not going so well. They're scared, they're anxious, they're worried about what's going to happen to them. They're worried if they're going to have to have surgery or they have cancer cancer. They're even worried if they even might die. So patients are so anxious. And when we can reduce their anxiety by using AIDIT, it helps them to have a better test or procedure, and it helps us to get a better quality outcome, which increases the quality of care that we're providing to our patients. If you ask most healthcare workers why they went into healthcare, I think deep down it wasn't for the pay and I don't think it was for the stress-free lifestyle. I got to believe because they felt good about helping people to make a difference and that's what it's all about. Something that really resonated with me in this video, so I hope you've had an opportunity to write down some answers to those questions, is that when we can do things with respect to patient satisfaction in mind. It decreases anxiety, and if it decreases anxiety and our patients are more compliant, they generally have better clinical outcomes, but they have a higher good patient experience, which is what we want to do. So let's further that along. Once introduced to ADIT, let's see if our nurse learned anything about how to communicate. Miss Cunningham, Miss Bridget Cunningham. Hi, I'm Bridget Cunningham. Hello, I'm Liz O'Donnell. I'm Dr. Gerard's nurse. It's nice to meet you, Liz. If you'll come with me, we'll get you ready to see the doctor. Sure. Miss Cunningham, if you'll just come with me. If you'll step up on the scales. Okay, very good. Just step down, be careful. Just so you know, we do monitor your weight with each office visit. It's a way to monitor your weight, but it's also a way for us to see how well the baby's growing. Great, thank okay, you. Okay, if you'll have a seat, I'm going to get your blood pressure as well. Just let me get a little sanitizer here first. And I'm going to get your blood pressure. Just so you know, sometimes when I'm nervous, my blood pressure goes up, and I get really nervous at the doctor's office. Okay, I will make a note of that for the doctor, and he very well may do another blood pressure at the end of the visit if your blood pressure's up a little bit. Okay. okay. Have you been here long? Yes, I've been here. Um, I've been here with uh, Dr. Gerard for three years, but I also worked with him over in labor and delivery for seven. So uh, he and I've worked together for close to 10 years. That's very reassuring. Okay, your blood pressure is 128 over 82. And your pulse is 78. 
he's probably going to ask you a few questions and he's going to do some tests today, probably a urine test and maybe an ultrasound. He always anticipates that the first visit is usually a little bit longer than the other visits because he knows there's always going to be questions. I have a lot. <laughs> And he anticipates that. So uh, he should be in very shortly. So just make yourself comfortable, and he should be here momentarily. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you. My nurse actress is right back there in the corner, Liz O'Donnell. Give it up for Liz O'Donnell. Liz is a nurse, so she knows how to do that stuff. That's the reason she played. As you see on the screen, now you get to have a little bit of interaction at your table. We're going to take about five minutes for this exercise. I want you to think about your experience on the receiving side of care. Write down some notes there on the page. Uh, it's on page four. And then I want you to pick somebody at your table and share with them if it was good or if it were bad, what made it good or bad. You have five minutes. Let's make some noise. Go. All right, guys. Let's go on. We're going to do a little group participation now. See how well you pay attention. Every time I introduce a new aspect of AIDIT, I'm going to say something similar to the first letter in AIDIT is A, and it stands for, and you yell out to me the word that we're talking about. So let's practice. The first letter in AIDIT is A, and it stands for? Acknowledged. That's pretty good. We'll just keep that one. Acknowledged. Always make sure that you greet patients and staff in a pleasant manner. Who knows it costs you nothing to put a smile on your face? Who knows that you can actually smile while you're talking on the telephone? Because believe me, if you're not smiling, your recipient knows it. Always greet people in a positive manner. Show a positive attitude. Be prepared. Use the patient's name. Be careful here. Older gentleman, Mr. Smith, might not want to be called Bob if you don't have that kind of relationship with him. Call him Mr. Smith until you know better. Until he says, hey, you can call me Chuck or whatever his name is. Use the EMR to gain knowledge about their appointment and history. Here's a thought. Let's say you're taking care of a patient and that patient's daughter trains horses. Man, if you put a little note like that in the EMR, then that patient shows up again. And you said, hey, how's Susan doing with her horse training business? You're going to make a buddy for life. That person gets a survey, I promise you, they're going to give you high, high marks. They're going to say, wow, what's your name? Sarita. Sarita is the best I've ever seen. Fist bump, Sarita. That's what they're going to say. <laughs> Hopefully you get some accolades in your department, but you're going to be helping Health First Medical Group to increase its patient experience scores. Make sure you make patients feel comfortable. When somebody's standing across from you as a patient, they need to be the most important person in your world for this interaction. Lisa? Archer, you are the most important person in my world right now. Wow, Do you nice. feel that way? Yeah. Awesome. Good. See, that's how your patients need to feel. Also, remember, we've got, you're welcome. Did I, did I say you're welcome? Yeah. You're, you're welcome. Also, make sure that you are keeping in mind nonverbal communication. Smile. Make eye contact. Respect people's personal space as much as possible. Listen to the patient, but allow time for silence. Sometimes we fire questions. Boom, let me have your insurance card. Let me see. Hey, have you done that? And you give people no time to respond. And I know why. You're busy. The line's stacking up. you got 700 more people you got to see today. That's the mode that you're in. But people have to have a little bit of opportunity to respond. Make sure you don't interrupt them. Unless they're blathering on and on and on about their bowel movement, and you've already heard it for four minutes, Gently redirect them somewhere else. Keep your body language relaxed, calm, non-threatening. Don't sit there with your arms crossed when you're dealing with patients. Furrow your brow. Make a frowny face. Make a frowny face at me since you're looking at me. Make a frowny face. Good. Yeah, you don't want to do that to a patient. You can do that in here, but don't do that to patients. Smile as much as you possibly can. A lot is communicated when you do that. Be sensitive to cultural differences. Now, what am I talking about there? Do you realize that if someone breaks eye contact with you and they don't look like you, that can be a sign of respect, not disrespect. So always make sure you keep those cultural nuances in mind. Let's see if you learned anything. The second letter in AIDIT is I, and it stands for? Introduce. Introduce. Very good. And this is one of the two that I think you'll find a little disconcerting because the first generation of this is to state your name and your job title. Tell me your name and your job title. Carlos Hernandez. And your job title? 
Work again. Awesome. See, that's what we all do first generation. You state your name and your title. But you can expand this to your certification, your licensure, how many years that you've been doing, whatever you've done, how much experience you have with procedures. Now, if you're brand new, hired right out of school and you've never done anything, please don't tell them that. Instead, <laughs> say in our department we have 27 years of experience. Dovetail on your colleagues that have been around for a while. Don't say, hey, I'm a nurse. I've never given you an injection before. May I stick you? Uh, because I would tell you no, and probably others will tell you no. State any special training you've had. Now, here's where it gets a little on the take care of the internal customer side. Manage transitions to other staff members. When you hand off somebody, make sure you are couching that person in a positive light. You're going to be roomed by Susie. Susie's going to take good care of you. If you and Susie have had an argument, don't say, you're going to be roomed by Susie, and man, she's a real beep. You know, you don't want to go anywhere near her. <laughs> don't do that. Manage positive transitions. You give something to the doctor, hey, you're going to be seen by Dr. Hernandez. Man, he's been around. He's the best blop, blop, blop in creation. If you don't like Dr. Hernandez, that doesn't matter. When you talk to the patient, remember, it's not about your comfortability. It's about decreasing the patient's anxiety. Decreased anxiety and better adherence means they have better clinical outcomes, but more importantly, they have a better perception of their experience. Always highlight the skill and expertise of the healthcare team the best you possibly can. This whole idea of managing up when I give a transition to a coworker or to a provider or to another department, say things in a positive light. We need to get a lot better about sharing positivity throughout the medical group. You don't want to say, I'm sending you to the lab and good luck. You don't want to say that kind of thing. <laughs> They're always late, yeah. Or, golly, the EMR has sucked since I've been here and it's not going to get any better. You don't want to say that kind of stuff. You don't want to say that to patients. We always need to speak of a point of empathy. Align skills among departments. Make patients feel better about the next caregiver. Make patients feel at ease about the care coordination they're going to get. And you're going to give your coworker a head start with the patient. If you frame your handoff in a positive manner, patient's going to feel good, and that person gets a leg up. They get to start on a positive note. Positivity breeds positivity. Do you know that negativity also breeds negativity? You ever had that experience where Susie, I'm picking on Susie if your name is Susie, love you, I'm using your name. Susie comes in, Susie's had a bad hair day, and by the time she's been there an hour, everybody else in a clinic is starting to feel bad, right? Negativity breeds negativity, but positivity also breeds positivity. Make sure you're positive. The third letter in aided is D, and that stands for? Duration. duration. Here's where we need to get a little better according to our comments. We always need to make sure that we are keeping patients informed about wait times or if we're running behind schedule or the length of time it's going to take to do an assessment, a preparation, an exam, a procedure, a test, or whatever. But note the bottom one, when tests are going to be available. I don't know what's going on. We consistently score poorly in this with Press Ganey, almost like a 75%. C, always, that uh, there's 25% of our patient population that says, nope, nobody ever contacts me. I have no idea what my results are. And, you know, there's only a couple ways that you can do it. Send them to a patient portal, have them come in for a return visit, call them on the phone, whatever you're going to do. But for some reason, there is a whole bunch of our patients that do not feel like we're explaining things to them. This whole idea of explaining duration is to decrease people's anxiety. Like the comment that you saw, I was put in the consulting room, you know, the little room, I do your blood pressure and then I leave you there and forget about you. People don't like that. We need to make sure we're telling people what the deal is. Someone shows up for an appointment, provider's running 15, 20 minutes behind, never hurts to say that. Hey, Dr. X was at the hospital, Dr. X is running behind. He's going to be with you as soon as we can. Is there anything we can do for you? Hey, the doctor's running 45 minutes behind. Give me your phone number. Go get a cup of coffee. I'll call you 15 minutes from your time. Hey, I'm telling you, there are clinics that do that. Maybe not health first. Maybe they should. And they have great patient satisfaction scores because of it. Always explain duration and wait times, but especially these, this idea of results. 
when results will be available, how do you get your results, push people to the patient portal. Say that for me. Push, push pe people to the patient portal. Excellent. Push people to the patient portal. The fourth letter in AIDIT is E, and that stands for? Explanation. Explanation. This is kind of like duration. Explanation means that we should always explain to patients and family members any processes or procedures that are going on, what they should expect, what the plan is for the future, but particularly who to contact for follow-up. Get a lot of comments about, hey, I'm trying to get a hold of my clinical data and I'm in a phone loop, nobody ever answers. I have left seven messages, no one's ever responded. I left the visit, no one told me how to follow up, what the next step was. We need to make sure that we are explaining things to our patient, but we also need to make sure we're explaining things to somebody's family member. That's part of acknowledging. So if the patient's there with their spouse, Make sure you're talking to the spouse, too. The spouse is your ally. Spouse will not be your ally if it's a bad experience. So make sure everybody that's there that's serving as part of the care team. And I thought you were going to hit me with that. I was like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> everybody that's there is, in the, is, is part of the care team and needs to have an explanation about what's going on. The fifth letter in AIDED is T, and that stands for? Thank you. The fifth letter of AIDED is T, and that stands for? Thank you. Thank you. Remember. Our patients have a choice. They don't have to come to health first. We should get in the habit of letting patients know that we've enjoyed working with them, thanking them for trusting health first with their care. Remember, they're vulnerable. Something is broken or their perception is something is broken. You get a lot of brownie points for somebody if you say, thank you for letting me take care of you today. That's the kind of thing that we need to do. It's going to feel a little odd at first. I don't hear a lot of thank you. Sometimes I, I hear a lot of courtesy, but I don't hear a lot of thank you. The big important thing when you're about to leave a patient is to ask the patient, is there anything else I can do for you before you hand off, leave, leave the room? Are you okay? Can I get you anything? Is there anything else I can do for you? It will go miles for patient engagement miles for customer experience, miles for positivity, and that's exactly what we want to do. You know, even providers, when exposed to this, can flip a switch and have a better experience. Let's see that in action. Wow, the staff here is so nice. I hope the doctor's just as nice. If he is, my pregnancy is just going to be fabulous. Come in. Hi, Ms. Cunningham. Hi. Hi, I'm Dr. Gerard. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's nice to meet you, too. So, uh, you're here because you're pregnant? Yes, it's oh, our well, first. That's, that's very, very great. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I read through the forms that you filled out before I came in. It looks like you're pretty healthy. There are no significant health issues that we're going to be concerned about. I did see that you get a little elevated blood pressure when you're nervous. It's not a problem. Um, we call that white coat hypertension. I'll just have my nurse take your vitals again before you leave. I get nervous uh, at the doctors. <laughs> uh, it's understandable. Everybody does once in a while. So um, I understand this is your first pregnancy, huh? Yes. Oh, well, that's great. Well, I appreciate you choosing Health First Medical Group. Um, we're going to take good care of you. Uh, I've been practicing around here for about 10 years, and I've delivered many, many healthy babies. So rest assured, you're in great hands, and we're going to take great care of you. Thank you so much, doctor. No problem. So, um, your history doesn't give me any cause for concern. Uh, you're not a high risk based on your age. So, um, what we're going to need to do next is we're going to need to do an examination and then send you down to the lab so you can have some uh, routine tests done. Okay. Uh, did you have any other questions? Not right now, thank you. All right, well, if you do have any other questions, just please feel free to ask. Uh, my nurse Liz is going to be your uh, conduit for the entire length of your pregnancy. So. You know, go ahead and use her to your advantage if you ever need to, and we're happy to have you with us. Thank you so much, Thank Doctor. Thank you for choosing Health First Medical Group. Thank you. Right. Nice meeting day. you. We'll see you back in a bit. Um, so just hang tight and go ahead and undress from the waist down, and my nurse and I will be back with you in about 10 minutes. All right, great. All right. Thank you. Over there is my doctor actor, Tyler Gerard. Get up for Tyler. <laughs> but I would be remiss. If I didn't point out our patient actress as well, Bridget Cunningham. Give it up for Bridget. All right, a little more interaction. Turn to pages six and seven in your participant guide. You're going to fill in the worksheet about how you can use AIDIT in your own role. 
If you need additional practice, you can turn to page eight. We'll take maybe eight minutes to do this. Make some noise while you do it, so I know you're doing something. Turn to pages six and seven. Thank you. All right. All right. Remember, you have page eight in your handout. If you'd like to explore additional ways to think about this in your role, some of you will find this is easily transformative to where you work. Others of you will just have to kind of glean the principles of good customer service, thinking about acknowledging and being kind and respectful. Some of you need to find that mean person at your table and tell them you really need to take this to heart. So go ahead, find that mean person at your table and say you need to take this to heart. Okay, okay, that's enough. Let's be positive. Turn to page nine in your participant guide. And on page nine, you're going to find a grid. I'm going to show you some real life interactions of the ADIT. A, a person coming in for care, some real life examples of this. Everything from a radiology receptionist to a radiology tech to another receptionist to a nurse. You're going to see these interactions. And where you see ADIT being utilized, write that down in the column. So I hope we're all tracking. Radiology, receptionist, if you see anything that deals with ADIT, put that in the first column. And then we're going to go from left to right in the videos that we watch. So this takes about nine minutes. And uh, see what you can see. Then we'll kind of do a comparison at the end. ADA began at Holy Cross Hospital on the south side of Chicago in 1993. It began when a physician we had recruited, Dr. Evelyn Diaz, joined our staff and she was with us for about three weeks and she came to us very frustrated and said, I no longer want to be a part of your team. And we asked Dr. Diaz why and she said if we couldn't take care of our patients your patients any better than we do, then I don't want to be your partner. I spent my whole life becoming a doctor, and I truly want my patients to be treated well. Uh, with that information, we asked Dr. Diaz if she would just give us a chance, and I met with about 150 employees. And I think this is what's exciting about ADIT. It was truly created by the employees. And as we all got together, I asked them to think about if it was our families we were taking care of, our friends, our neighbors, what kind of experience did we want that to become? And uh, we struggled for several hours, and when it was all said and done, they wanted to create AIDED, which was the five fundamentals of service. A is acknowledgement, that means we want to have a great eye contact, whether that person is a customer that you're seeing in front of you or it's somebody that you're talking to on the phone, we want to let them know that they are the most important part of our interaction and that we genuinely care about them. I is the ability to introduce yourself and what role you're going to provide in that care, to manage up and let people know that you're in very good hands. The average inpatient that's in the hospital for four days comes in contact anywhere between 60 and 70 employees. That's a lot of people coming in and out of your lives. The gift we want to give our patients is that they're in very caring, loving hands. And by taking the time to introduce ourselves and to uh, share our experience, experience, it helps the, our patients and their families to feel confident in the person taking care of them. The third thing we look to do is duration. We know that in setting time expectations is very important to patients. And let me give you an example. My son, who is 16 years old, uh, plays baseball. And when he got hit by a pitch, he went to the ED. And as we were sitting in the ED, the doctor had said that since he got hit in the head, he's going to need to have a CAT scan. So as we were waiting in the waiting room, the nurse came up to us and said, Mr. Dean, I want to apologize ahead of time. We have three patients that are ahead of you and it's going to be at least an hour and a half to two hours before we can get your son in for a CT and we truly think he needs that uh, so I apologize. Now I could have sat out there and, and been waiting and frustrated. If I'm sure if no one came up to me and told me I'd be wondering did they forget about me? Do they know why I'm here? 
what, why do I, why do I need to have uh, this test anyhow? And maybe I would have voted with my feet. Maybe I would have got mad and even laughed. But by her coming out and and reducing my anxiety and letting me know that uh, that we're going to get to just as soon as we can, I was fine with the wait. So time expectation was the third part of ADIT that we we believe important. The fourth is explanation. We found that uh, with so many people going in and out of our patients' lives, every patient has a right to know who you are and what role you're going to provide in that care. So we trained hard to have each of our employees begin to explain what it was they're going to do before we did it. T stands for thank you. We want to be able to not only thank people when they come to us for uh, a test or a procedure, we also want to thank them for trusting us. We know that patients are very anxious. My mom is uh, 75 years old and she still gets the Reader's Digest. In the Reader's Digest, one of the headlines were 14 ways to survive your hospital stay. So we recognize that when patients come to us, it's a time in their life when things may be not going so well. They're scared, they're anxious, they're worried about what's going to happen to them. They're worried if they're going to have to have surgery or they have cancer. They're even worried if they even might die. So patients are so anxious. And when we can reduce their anxiety by using AIDID, it helps them to have a better test or procedure, and it helps us to get a better quality outcome, which increases the quality of care that we're providing to our patients. If you ask most healthcare workers why they went into healthcare, I think deep down it wasn't for the pay, and I don't think it was for the stress-free lifestyle. I gotta believe because they felt good about helping people to make a difference, and that's what it's all about. Can I help you? Okay, I'm uh, here for chest x-ray. Okay. And what's your name? Don Little. Okay, and I have it here. You're going to get a chest x-ray, and it should be about 10 to 15 minutes, and you can have a seat anywhere in the weight area, and I'll get to you momentarily, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. The first interaction that a patient or family has with any medical center is often the first phone call that's made either by the referring physician or by the family trying to get directions to figure out how to get through this complex maze that represents a modern medical center. And so it's important that at that very first contact individuals understand that they are setting the stage again for how the rest of that visit, that engagement, that encounter will go. You know it's incredibly frightening to come to a large medical center. And it's really nice to see a smiling face when you first walk in the door. There's something that provides reassurance and uh, it's one of those things that as a patient makes you feel just a little less tense, lets you feel affirm that you're where you're supposed to be. You know, it's also incredibly important to give people a sense of the time to expect to wait. I think one of the worst experiences that any of us have is to be placed in an exam room at some point and you just come to that point where you wonder, gosh, do people still know that I'm here? Have they forgotten me? The same thing occurs when somebody's waiting for a procedure. And so it's incredibly important to give people an expectation, but to be sure that we respond before that time frame has run. Just a little? Yeah. yeah. How are you doing, sir? My name is Marcus. I'll be your x-ray tech. Okay. All right, come on back and uh, we'll get a couple of images of you. Okay. Uh, where, where are you from? Uh, Town Creek, or Hatton, where Town Creek is, Motown. Town Creek, I know, I know Anston, I got relatives down in well, Huntsville. Okay, <clears throat> I live between Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and Decatur. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll be getting a couple x-rays. You have any x-rays done at, at Vandy before? Uh, not here before, I have uh -huh. Okay, well, I'll get you in, take a couple of images, uh, get you out like five minutes. Okay. Right, come on okay. in. Mm -hmm. Let me get your date of birth. 
<laughs> All right, got the right person. Marcus does such an excellent job in terms of establishing rapport very quickly. One of the things that people always talk about and have this notion is, is it takes a long time. But you saw in this video clip how easy it was for Marcus to express some human concern about an individual. And we know that interest in me as an individual is one of the things that's so important to establishing rapport with members of the team. And he does such a nice job in terms of demonstrating that. In addition, he gives, again, a very clear explanation of what's going to occur. Uh, patients often are concerned that they don't know exactly what's going to happen behind the closed door, and it's really important to give people a sense of that in advance. Uh, finally, one of the things that I really like is that you see a nice demonstration of safety, because not only does Marcus confirm the patient that he's dealing with, he also confirms that again by comparing birth dates. And these techniques are a part of getting to know people, but it's also a very important message of safety and how we promote doing the right thing to the right patient. Miss Little? All right, come on out. Okay. I'm going to go right over here over this x-ray board. And this board is kind of cold and hard, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, we'll put your chest right up against there for me. Up yes, sir. All right, we'll get you real close there. I'm going to roll your shoulders in a little bit. And then uh, what I'll do is I'll have you take in a big, deep breath, uh -huh. and you'll just hold it in, okay? Okay. All right. Again, Marcus does such a nice job in sort of setting or helping to set expectations. No one likes to be surprised, especially a surprise where I'm suddenly cold and uncomfortable. And it's such a nice thing to warn people in advance. Okay, sir. That's it. Went too bad, was it? <laughs> All right. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. All right, have a nice day and get the feeling better. You too. All you right. Too. I'm feeling better. All right, and uh, go Auburn. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> go in here. You see such a nice example of showing concern for a human being. One of the things that I really like is that what when... Marcus is speaking to the patient, he's looking at the patient. And that's such an important technique because it's so important for us to understand that people listen to the spoken word, but nonverbal communication is as important as the spoken word. And so you see Marcus both relaxed, but you also see him making visual contact. Those things send important signals. The other observation here is that you see an expression back from the patient to Marcus. There is a bond. Those things are very important and uh, one of the things that we do as medical professionals is to look for those and it is an affirmation that there has been this connectedness which again is very important in terms of promoting optimal outcomes of these healthcare experiences. Hello. Hello. Could you sign in for me, please? Yes, I'm Vicki Gann. I'll be checking you in today. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay, Mr. Little, uh, you're a new patient, so did you get your new patient forms yes, in the mail? Yes, Okay, yes, we will get those. Let me pull you up here. Make okay. sure we've got them all correct. Vicki demonstrates some very nice techniques in terms of reception. She doesn't make the assumption that the forms have been received. She asks. She gives Mr. Little an opportunity to respond. In addition, she checks to see whether we've gotten that okay. So often, families feel as though they haven't done things appropriately. Vicki takes the responsibility on as to whether we've gotten that right. Now the only other observation that I would make, and we all get into this from time to time, is sometimes there's an incredibly important need for a pause. So, for example, when Mr. Little first comes to the reception desk, there is a greeting, and sometimes it's really nice to pause just a few seconds to allow the family to respond before we give them direction, and that's a technique that sometimes is tough, we get busy, but something that may aid that interaction just a little bit. Okay, 
you finished your uh, paper, your form, mm -hmm. and I see you have a CD for Dr. Putnam. Mm -hmm. So it looks like you've got everything filled out. And uh, here is your communication with the family that you get to take home with you in case uh, your wife has to call in for any information about you. Okay. And you have two patients ahead of you, so Dr. Putnam should call you back maybe in about 20 minutes because he takes time with his patients. And uh, they'll put you in a room and then he'll be with you as soon as he's through. It's really nice to give families some sort of understanding about what to expect. Oftentimes individuals will sit in large waiting rooms, they see many people call back. The nice thing is that Vicki's done a nice job of telling uh, Mr. Little that there are two people in front of them. That gives, she gives some expectation about what kind of wait to expect. These things are very important, again, because one of the things that you often see is people sitting and sort of wondering, well, am I next, or is this person next, and maybe I've been forgotten. This handles it quite nicely. The other observation that I make is that she does a nice job to give an explanation of why it may take a little extra time, because Dr. Putnam likes to spend time uh, with his patients. This is an important affirmation, and again, another nice opportunity of managing up. Mr. Little? Yes, ma'am. Hi, come on back. I'm Mary Lee Hanneman. I'm the nurse here in the thoracic surgery nice. department. Nice to meet you. Come on back. Okay. How are you, Miss Little? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We're going to go right back here to room four. Just follow me. So you're coming in from uh, Alabama? Yes, ma'am. I live uh, hmm, close to Muscle Shoals, Alabama. I see. I see you have you on your roll tight hat. I hate to tell you, I'm an LSU fan. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> have a seat in the first chair right next to the desk for okay. me. Okay. And Miss Little right next to him. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing today. Um, since you're, uh, is this your first time at Vanderbilt? Yes, ma'am. Well, welcome to Vanderbilt. Thank you. Um, how we kind of run our clinic is um, I'll be doing your vital signs, and then, you know, I'll have you filled out some new patient information. Mm -hmm. I'm going to enter everything in the computer. So we're going to be talking, and I'm going to be typing a lot as well. We don't do too much writing anymore in, in our charts, mm -hmm. so don't think that I'm not listening. Okay. I am. Okay. I'm just typing okay. and talking at the same time, okay? okay? Mary Lee does a nice job in terms of going to the reception area and uh, calling for Mr. Little. Does a nice job escorting him down the hallway. The other thing I really like here is a little expression that there's life outside of medicine. You know, I'm sorry that she's an LSU fan, but the nice thing about it is that here's an opportunity to link to another individual about something where there is an experience, again, outside of the healthcare setting. That's important. Families often tell us that they never get a sense that we see them as human beings with lives outside of those moments that we spend with them in the exam room. And this was a really nice example of uh, uh, expressing uh, interest in something else that this individual clearly is interested in, uh, that is uh, Roll Tide. Now the other things that I observed is that uh, it's important to provide an explanation that we listen and one of the challenges that we have in this computer age is in fact how we make visual contact that we send the clear message that patient we do hear you we are responding. I think a very nice technique is to affirm to the patient that we've heard them and in fact what we're doing is recording their observations because that's an incredibly important part of the medical uh, process. This is the first time that Mr. Little looks anxious. So if you look at him throughout this point, we're now back in the exam room. We're getting closer to the point where we're going to have to deal with the challenge that brought us here. And some acknowledgement of fear and concern can often be very important. Dr. Putnam has a partner, Dr. Eric Lambright. So there's two surgeons here in the department. Mm -hmm. um, both are very excellent. Um, you'll, Dr. Putnam sees patients on Tuesdays and Dr. Lambright sees patients on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. um, 
So just to let you know, you know, he does have a, another partner here, uh, mm -hmm. and, and occasionally, you know, they'll see each other's patients if uh, it is needed. Mm -hmm. It is important to introduce all the potential members of the team. Again, a part of this process of keeping people aware if they're partners that may be engaged in care, may have to cover when someone's out, it's important to tell individuals in advance that they may see someone else. One of the other things, though, that might be provided as a reassurance is that there's the mention of two days a week in which physicians are there to see one. What about the other days of the week? Will there be someone? So sometimes the issue of providing explanations may, in fact, create additional questions that need to be addressed. And one question in this circumstance is, gosh, if I have need of a physician on Monday, will there be someone here to see me? Vanderbilt's an awesome place. It's an okay. awesome place and you'll be very, you'll be treated like you've never been treated before. Okay. You know, um, okay. this department works really hard in um, taking good care of our patients from nursing through the medicine part through the scheduling part we have a we have a great department so okay. um, um, I'm happy that you're here okay mr. Um, little this is actually concludes our history and physical so let me just tell you a little bit about what's going to happen the rest of the day for you um, you've met with me and I've done your uh, history and physical and your vitals um, then dr. Putnam will come in and he will see you and do his history of physical and his consult. Mm -hmm. um, he'll give you his recommendations, and then you'll meet with Allison, who's our Allison Duncan. She's mm -hmm. our surgery scheduler. She's been doing um, surgery scheduling now for our department for about two years, mm -hmm. and helps with coordinating the cases and setting up for your appointments. Um, and then after that, you're, you'll be finished for the rest of the day. Now, I don't know if you're aware, but Dr. Putnam is the chairman for this department. Um, he's in, involved in a lot of research um, and works with many of the other departments such as oncology and pulmonary. Um, so you'll uh, have access to all those wonderful physicians and nurses and, and teams. Um, our department is actually getting ready to merge with the oncology department, so we'll be housed all together. So it makes it more convenient for you as a patient to be able to come in and get all the services that you need under one, one particular <coughs> clinic. Okay. Do you have any questions for me? No. That's, well, you pretty well covered it good. A uh, uh, excellent. Excellent. Okay. Um, if there's anything else I can do for you, please let me know. Okay. All right. Very Thank nice you. to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. It's really important to orient people to the healthcare system that they're a part of. And sometimes changes occur in those healthcare settings. And yet I think that orienting someone also has to be balanced though, considering where they are in their own illness at that particular moment. And so it is important at some point to let Mr. Little know that there may be changes, but at the same time, I would suspect that at this particular moment, Mr. Little is most concerned about what kind of surgery he may need, what the prognosis may mean, what is this going to mean for his life. And so I think it is not unreasonable that in a circumstance like this that he may not well remember the messages that are transmitted, which means that sometimes we just have to follow up and do it again for a host of very valid reasons. Another concern that I would just express is that it is very important that we in fact manage up. It is important to uh, send the clear message that our determination is to deliver the best care that we can deliver. It's important to recognize, however, that we don't always achieve our intended goal. And when we don't, we have to have equal amounts of humility to acknowledge our failures in the same way that we are attempting to manage up our entire health system. One of the other things that's incredibly important is to always give people an opportunity to ask questions. One of the things that was modeled in this segment was to see whether or not Mr. Little had any questions. One of the techniques, though, that I think is incredibly important to go along with this question, again, is to take a significant pause after asking an, an individual, do they have a question, to be sure that, in fact, uh, they've had adequate opportunity to voice that question uh, because sometimes it takes people a while to in fact formulate that question.
I think it's incredibly important for all of us who are engaged in healthcare delivery to pause periodically to reflect about how we have interacted with our patients, how we, uh, what things we've done well, what things we could do better. Pausing and reviewing a video like this is incredibly helpful because when I do that, I see things that are modeled that are incredibly good and I need to emulate those things. But you know, the other thing I see is that I see some things that I might have personally done different in the same way that people who would watch me in the practice of medicine would say, gosh, I like this, I don't like that. That's okay, that's a part of the learning process as we attempt to learn from each other, to encourage each other. It's also important, and it's seen throughout this video, how individuals have used their own personal skills to link with patients, to send the message that they are individuals, that they have lives outside of medicine itself. We know from lots and lots of research studies that families just want a sense that we respect them as human beings. And if we ask somebody if they're an Alabama fan, that in itself sends a very clear message. I think it's also important that we develop tools or we have tools to help remind us of principles that are very important in engagement. The issues of being sure that we have identified who we are, what people are to expect, to give them a sense of how they should be oriented to the process. Those tools help us to become the professionals that we can be. Dr. Putnam, can I come in? Hey, oh, yes, how are you? Just fine, you? Hi, Bill Putnam. Long Little. Nice to visit with nice you, Mr. Little. Nice to meet you, too. Hi. Hey, Tina Little. Tina Little. Nice to visit with nice you. Nice to meet Pleasure. you, Pleasure. Welcome to, welcome to Nashville. Thank you. Is this your Thank first you. time here at Vanderbilt? Yes, sir, sure is. Well, I've been, I've been here about three years. I was down in Texas for 15 years down at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center and came okay. up here as head of a new department of thoracic surgery. Okay. So very happy to meet you and happy to help out and all, all right. that. I've been doing this for about 20 years. Yeah. So. That's good. <laughs> so we'll take good care of you here. Okay. Um, how are you feeling today? I feel just fine. My nurse talked to you and all that? My nurse talked to you a yes, few minutes? Yes, sir. Yes. Were there any questions that came up when? Uh, uh, no, sir, not really. I mean, you know, well, she just asked me how I felt and if I ever had any pain and all this and a lot of questions. I said, really, not, not to my opinion, anything that really hurts, you know. You know, we have this great electronic system here for our notes and all that. Mm -hmm. So the only, the problem with this is that, is that I can get great information from here, but I can't look at you and look at here at the same time. Oh, yeah, okay. If it was my mom, you know, she'd have eyes in the back of her head, and she would yeah, have, okay. no, she'd have okay. no problems right. with that. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm, not that, uh, I'm not that adept. Okay. So let me pull up here and see what she had written down about things and, and all that. Now, I spoke to Dr. Chua, your doctor yes, at home. Seems like a pretty fine fellow. Yes, sir. He, he seemed like a good fellow. And um, told me a little bit about you and all that and said, can we visit with you? Said you're a little bit concerned about things. Is yes, sir. Dr. Putnam demonstrates several really outstanding techniques. First, he knocks on the door. And if you noticed, he asked for permission to enter the room. I think this is incredibly important because it shows a sign of respect to the patient. This is the patient's space at this moment and I would like to enter and partner. It's a very clear message of partnership that I think is, uh, sets the stage very nicely. The other thing that Dr. Putnam does that I'm incredibly impressed with is he refers to the referring physician by name. We're in partnership, and that partnership extends way beyond the walls of our academic center and extends out into the referral community. And we deal with individuals who want to be dealt with with respect as well. And so Mr. Little's physician has a name. 
he's referred to, there is this sense conveyed that there is this willingness to partner. So often large academic institutions get the bad rap that we just are here, we exist in isolation. And Dr. Putnam dispels that very nicely with a referral to Dr. Chua by name. The other thing that's incredibly important to observe was that when Dr. Putnam implied that he was an experienced surgeon, there was something that was immediately seen in terms of Mr. Little patting Dr. Putnam on the arm. It was almost, there's a relief. I have come to this institution to deal with something that is a great trouble and concern to me and now I'm dealing with someone with experience and there is this immediate expression of relief. I think that says a lot about the tension and concerns that families have and that they are looking for the fact that they're going to partner with someone who will have the expertise to assist them with their medical problems. The 20 years is to Bill's benefit at this point, but Bill, when he practiced only five years, he still conveyed a sense of confidence. And so it is not arrogance, but it is the notion of conveying to the patient that I am experienced, I have expertise, and I am interested in partnering with you to deal with the challenge before us. That's the con message that is conveyed so effectively by Dr. Putnam. In addition, Dr. Putnam is very fortunate that he has a very reassuring voice. It sends this message of quiet confidence. In addition, if you look at his nonverbal communication as well, he looks open, he's listening, he pauses, he faces Mr. Little, even though he again mentions the challenge of dealing with the electronic medical record, he still sends this message that I'm paying attention to you. Another observation in this segment is the fact that Dr. Putnam mentions an aspect of his personal life. Again, as we think about interviews with families about what works, what doesn't work well, one of the things that families want is that they want a sense that we see them as fellow human beings with fellow life experiences. And by Dr. Putnam mentioning the fact that uh, uh, his mother may have had eyes in the back of her head, uh, that reminds us of experiences that we've all had and says we are all connected as a part of members of the human race. We've had about uh, 15 minutes here to talk about things. We'll have about another 15 minutes and mm -hmm. do a brief exam and go over your x-rays and all that. Okay. You may have to sit up here just for a few minutes and okay. just take a listen to, your, listen to your heart and lungs and all that. Okay. I think it's really important to recognize at this point that Mr. Little has been at this process now for in excess of eight hours. Uh, sometimes in the middle of the exam room, we don't always remember that individuals got up early this morning, got in their car, fought traffic, got into the institution, went in for the first test, and now, over eight hours later, are to the point of getting the first aspect of the physical exam. Sometimes that process is lost on all of us because we have simply gone from one patient to the next patient. But it's important to recognize in this case that Mr. Little and Ms. Little have been at this for a long time. So there's two questions that I have to answer. The first question is, what is the extent of the disease? Um, where is it? Has it spread? And secondly, is there an operation that I can do safely to make you better? Sometimes operations in and of themselves are enough. Sometimes it's helpful to get the opinions of other doctors who could consider chemotherapy or radi radiation therapy or some combinations of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery to remove, to remove the tumor. Mm -hmm. Okay? So there are a couple, there are, a, there are some other physicians that I'll have you see as well. One of them will be Dr. Craig Lockhart who is one of our medical oncologists who has a special focus on treating patients with esophageal cancer. He and I have worked together not only at this institution but also in one of our national groups looking at how do we make esophageal cancer treatment better for larger numbers of patients mm -hmm. in some clinical trials, but he's excellent. The other person that you'll meet is a radiation oncology physician. Her name is Bapsi Shack, C-H-A-K and uh, she focuses entirely on 
treating patients with esophageal cancer with radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. Now we've worked together very closely over the last three years in utilizing the best chemotherapy, the best radiation therapy, and the best surgery in order to provide the best results for you. Mm -hmm. So I can do an operation, but I know that there are limits to the, to the success of just an operation. Mm -hmm. We do know that if we can use the chemotherapy and radiation up front and then do an operation, the patients have better survival. Our operation can be easier, more easily performed, and the chemotherapy and radiation therapy can sometimes kill all the cancer in about 15% of patients. Okay. 15 to actually about 25 percent of patients. Okay. But I can't tell you if, if you're, going, you're going to be in the 25 percent with no cancer mm -hmm. or the 75 percent that do have some cancer yeah. cells remaining. So an operation is needed mm -hmm. after the chemotherapy and radiation are given, mm -hmm. particularly in patients who, can, who are physiologically fit, who are strong enough for an operation. Dr. Putnam at this point is facing one of the greatest challenges, but so is Mr. Little. Mr. Little has come to have some explanation, some recommendations, to discuss what this may mean for him as an individual. You can see that reflected in Mr. Little as you look at his body language during this exchange. He is very focused and very concerned. Dr. Putnam does a very nice job in explaining the fact that there are different modalities, different ways in which Mr. Little may be treated and that there are some stages in terms of deciding what needs to be done. This is very complex and as you can imagine, in a circumstance where Mr. Little is very anxious and concerned, where Dr. Putnam is doing an outstanding job, that the two of them may need to repeat this several times to ensure that the message has been transmitted. And a key element of that is to give Mr. Little an opportunity to describe what Dr. Putnam's told him. What does this mean? And what are the questions Mr. Little may want to ask at this particular time? It's also incredibly important at this point to understand how everybody's contribution to the health care delivery this day for Mr. Little has an impact. Because if the process has gone well, if he's been received by individuals that seem to be concerned, if he has been told what to expect through the process, when we get to this moment in which critical information is going to be shared, there's a greater chance that it may be understood, it may be uh, adhered to, that appropriate questions may be asked. Uh, to the contrast, if this process has not gone well, if individuals have not received Mr. Little well, if they have not treated him with respect, if he sees that he is just another widget on a factory line, then this process is not likely to go very well. All right, that's good. And that's what you and your bride are going to do, is that right? Just put him down and not smoke anymore? <laughs> that's what I'm going to have to do, I know that. <laughs> Well, it's going to be important that your lungs are as clean as possible, right? Like a, like a coach trains an athlete for a race. Mm -hmm. So I can do my part, but you're going to need to do your part. Yeah, really. Now these nicotine patches, you know, they do get, have them in the stores, and you can get those and use mm -hmm. them as directed. But the key thing is for you to stop smoking, 100%. 100%. So you can take your cigarettes, and you can give them to the people you like or the people that you don't like. Okay. Okay? But no more for you. Okay. And no more smoking in the house. So you're going to have to go to the back porch or something like that. Okay. We've got to get you fixed up here. Okay. Okay. So just to go over again, breathing tests, some esophageal tests. We're going to have you see some other doctors for the ultrasound, for the question of chemotherapy, question of radiation. Get this thing on your right temple checked over. Mm -hmm. Then have the heart doctors check you for your, make sure your heart function is in good shape. Okay. All right and then we'll decide how best to proceed. Okay. Okay. Right. Now, is there anything else? Uh, we've covered a lot of stuff here today. We have. Is there anything else you want me to add in here that we've not talked about, that we need to talk about? <clears throat> no, sir, I can't. I actually can't think of nothing if you ain't, you know. We've covered a lot of stuff here. We've covered a lot, but, yeah. you know. Uh, well, please, I will ask you, do you think I, do you think I have a, I had a good time trip. Yeah, of it. I do.
And I think we, I think we can, I think there's some, I think we can bring some combinations of treatment to help you out a lot. Okay. okay. Well, I do appreciate that. Yeah. As far as the smoking, you don't worry about that because right. I ain't smoking no cigarettes. We're, we're in. <laughs> so, Ms. Little, are there any questions you have for me? Uh, I'm very quiet and patient here listening to us talk. No, not really. Just uh, kind of wanted to know what his chances, you know, what you felt like, if you could help him or not, you know. Yeah, well, we're going to get a, we're going to get a few tests to check on things and all that. Um, you've never had a PET scan, have you? Oh. A PET scan. That's scheduled for Friday too. Scheduled for Friday. At one o'clock. <coughs> Excellent. No, I got. <coughs> Okay. Good. Uh, if you do have to do radiation or chemo, would there be any way we could go back to Decatur to do that? Yes, ma'am. But I, what I'd want to do is to get our best ideas about your treatment combination here. Yep. And then if you need to have it done in Decatur. Well, can I ask you another question? Yeah. Would it be better to have it done here? Yeah. Well, this is, I think, a discussion you well, can have. I think you can have that discussion with Dr. Chack and Dr. Uh, uh, and, and our GI doctors, Dr. Chen. Okay, and well, what I say and then they can. Then you folks can decide how best to proceed. It's incredibly challenging to share so much information in the face of concern and anxiety. Dr. Putnam does a very nice job of giving the family an opportunity to ask questions. I also think it's incredibly important not to create inappropriate expectations at this particular point. It's the patient. I want to know what to expect. I want to know what the future is going to hold. I want to know, am I going to survive? In a circumstance like this, it's often unlikely that the physician at this moment really has a very good picture. And so sometimes there has to simply be the agreement that these discussions will occur over time as more information becomes available. It's so easy for the physician to simply want to, in a broad brush stroke, sort of say things are going to be okay. But that doesn't build trust in a circumstance where the family knows that this is very serious. And so Dr. Putnam does not paint this in a way that's too optimistic. He doesn't paint it in a way that's pessimistic. At this point, we have to go step by step. We're going to gather information and appropriately share. I think it's also incredibly important in a circumstance like this to recognize how uncomfortable everyone is in the room. The patient's anxious. The wife who's concerned about the health and well-being of her husband. Dr. Putnam, who does not like to be in a circumstance, as none of us do, sharing bad news about a life-changing diagnosis. But it has to be done, and it has to be done fairly and honestly and with some degree of compassion, which you see, again, an example of this is provided by Dr. Putnam in his body language. It's also important in a circumstance like this to use examples to help people understand. One of the nice things that Dr. Putnam does is that he uses the example of an athlete training for some kind of race. Uh, it is important to get your lungs in the best shape they can be. One of the ways that we can do this is by stopping smoking. Now it's important to ensure that Mr. Little understands this to actually take him through and discuss with him the use of a nicotine patch perhaps what that was going to mean, uh, how he's going to tolerate that, what that's going to mean towards smoking cessation. And a wonderful technique that might be used is that other members of the team might call Mr. Little after going back home to see if, in fact, he's been able to find the patch. Has he been able to use it? What is the ongoing commitment to try to reduce uh, tobacco consumption? The other thing that's important is that in no way does Dr. Putnam appear to blame or assign responsibility to Mr. Little for this problem. Unfortunately, many physicians, other medical professionals will use shame as a way to try to encourage people to stop habits that they shouldn't have. Uh, that is incredibly inappropriate at a time like this in which individuals 
by definition, are going to feel responsible. They f may feel guilt for the fact that they have been smoking, that we know that that contributes to a circumstance like this. And there is this great need for humanity and concern expressed in the fact that we are there to promote health and not to promote blame. Okay. Well, I don't have anything else to add here. Uh, we've talked about a lot of things, as we, we mentioned. Anything else we've, that has come up that okay. you want to ask about what, that we've not? What you're saying is the, the other doctors I see here, they're going to let them decide about the radiation or chemo or whatever? Yeah, we'll talk, we'll talk with them about okay. that. Okay, and then if I have to have it or whatever. We we'll try to make that decision together. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Any, anything else? That'd be, that'd be fine. That's just well, I appreciate it. a lot better than that, you know, I mean, but <clears throat> that's smoking. <laughs> I know, I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit. I appreciate that. I'm going to quit. <laughs> and I also appreciate your patience with me today. I know it's a few minutes late. <clears throat> well, I, but I, I'm, <clears throat> I, I appreciate your confidence in me and my team. Well, I do. Th thank we you for choosing. We've a lot of good things about you. Thank you. Sure Th thank you for choosing Vanderbilt. Well, I'm, 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 now, I'm going to have you visit with a very nice person. Her name is Allison Duncan. All right? Allison is our scheduling secretary, and she is excellent. Okay. We've, been, we've been working together for over three years now, and she's got, she's got all the... See, she's already made all those arrangements for you for Friday, mm -hmm. all, just automatically. Yeah. And she'll get these other tests done as well. And what, we'll try, what she'll do is she'll try to bunch them up together so that bunch them up together so, so that there are no um, so that they minim so you minimize your travel up mm -hmm. here to Nashville and we'll try, we'll try to make it as convenient for you yes. as possible. One thing Dr. Putnam does in this segment is to imply that the decision has been made by both of them. That this is a partnership process in which the patient has been engaged in making a decision about what's next. Well, that's the reality. I mean, in the end, patients are the ones that need to control what happens based upon the advice, suggestions we provide. And as long as we continue to reflect the fact that there is a partnership, we are much better off. So it appears to be contained, it appears to be treatable and we'll take good care of you. Okay, I appreciate that. Thanks. Okay. Let's, walk, let's walk next door here. <clears throat> We're going to walk right out here and we're going to make a right turn. Okay. Allison Duncan, Dr. Putnam's surgery scheduler. Okay, so okay. She'll, she, listen, she's going to take very good care of you <clears throat> and they're down from northern Alabama way. And okay. We'll get them so taken we'll try care to of. get them taken care of here. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate nice it. to visit nice with you. you. Nice Thank you. Yes, nice to visit Thank with you, you too, man. Much. You're very welcome. Okay. Go ahead and have a seat here, and okay. she'll be right with you. Okay. okay. The technique of Dr. Putnam escorting the family to scheduling is incredibly important. It says something about that I am concerned about you as an individual. It's a similar thing that we do when we escort someone to the front door of our house when they leave. It is a reflection of respect and mutual concern and if it's possible, uh, send such a positive message that is not likely to be forgotten by the family. I think it's incredibly important for all of us who are engaged in healthcare delivery to pause periodically, to reflect about how we have interacted with our patients, how we, uh, what things we've done well, what things we could do better. 
pausing and reviewing a video like this is incredibly helpful because when I do that I see things that are modeled that are incredibly good and I need to emulate those things but you know the other thing I see is that I see some things that I might have personally done different in the same way that people who would watch me in the practice of medicine would say gosh I like this I don't like that that's okay that's a part of the learning process as we attempt to learn from each other to encourage each other it's also important and it's seen throughout this video how individuals have used their own personal skills to link with patients, to send the message that they are individuals, that they have lives outside of medicine itself. We know from lots and lots of research studies that families just want a sense that we respect them as human beings. And if we ask somebody if they're an Alabama fan, that in itself sends a very clear message. I think it's also important that we develop tools or we have tools to help remind us of principles that are very important in engagement. The issues of being sure that we have identified who we are, what people are to expect, to give them a sense of how they should be oriented to the process. Those tools help us to become the professionals that we can be. Come in. Hello. Hi. How you doing? Just fine. Hi, my name is Chad Paco. Nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. So are you Mrs. Edelin? Yes. Is that how you say it? That's correct. All right. So my name is Chad Paco. I'm one of the internal medicine residents. So we kind of rotate all throughout the hospital, and today I'm following Dr. Sargent. Okay. I know you've been a patient of his for quite a while. Yes. How many years have you been a patient of his? close to probably 20 years. Have you really? Yes. Wow, 20 years. Well, I just want to tell you about Dr. Sargent. I'm not sure if you've heard of the, the Masters in Medicine. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. He actually just got inducted to that. Wow. Yeah, that's a, that's a big honor. That was actually happened, I think, about last month. So you can actually congratulate him on when he comes, because he's very humble and he usually doesn't talk about himself, but that's like almost like a Nobel Prize in medicine. Wow. It's very, very esteemed. So. I thought that was pretty neat. I figured I'd mention that to you today. All right. So for 20 years, you've been following with him? A, a give or take, yes. There was a few years when I didn't see him. Okay. I see that you have a history of rheumatoid arthritis. Is mm -hmm. that why you follow with him? Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, in any follow-up visit, it's important to continue to acknowledge the patient. You do that by knocking on the door saying hello when you enter. These things are incredibly important and were modeled quite nicely by the resident in this particular segment. On a follow-up visit where residents are involved, perhaps in a circumstance where the patient has seen the attending physician for many years, it's still important for those involved in care to go in to introduce themselves, to tell them why they're there, what's going to happen that day to orient them to the visit. Perhaps one of the things that might occur in a segment like this is for the resident to be sure that the family patient understands that after they've obtained history, done a preliminary exam, that Dr. Surgeon, the attending, will come in and be engaged in care. Sometimes families are concerned, well, am I really going to get to see the physician that I was scheduled to see, or are you a substitute or not? And so clarification of that is an incredibly important technique. One observation that can occasionally raise concern is related to body language. And I think one of the things that we have to be conscious about is the position of our feet, as an example. So one of the things that's observed in this segment is the sole of the resident's foot. Now, in many circumstances, cultures, that doesn't raise an issue at all. One of the things that I'm concerned about in this particular encounter is that once or twice, it seems as though the patient actually tends to move away a little bit, as though there is some concern about that foot touching the patient. It's also important to understand that there are uh, certain uh, groups that, whereas by culture, that's not acceptable, that that is, in fact, uh, a really negative image. And in that circumstance, that sort of posture would actually be offensive. And so it's very important also to have a sense of the cultural expectations, the norms of the patients that you're dealing with. It's one of the reasons that we need to have uh, a real degree of cultural sensitivity because sometimes things that may be perfectly acceptable for me in terms of certain kinds of hand shaking or patting as we saw in the segment with Dr. Putnam may be inappropriate in 
uh, with respect to some of the patients that we serve. It's also important to understand that all of us have different styles that we relate to other people. And there are certain social circumstances in which I will feel awkward, you may feel awkward. It's important to recognize that. And one of the things that I think we ought to constantly do is do self-assessment. So one of the things that all of us should do in the practice of medicine is periodically pause and ask ourselves, how did this go? What aspects of this uh, engagement with this patient family went well? What may have been uh, a little awkward? How do I assess why that occurred? What can I do next time to make that go even better? Let's take a look at your belly real quick. No pain when I push in your belly? Mm -hmm. No. Okay, you can go ahead and sit up. All right. All right, go ahead and take a seat. So suddenly you're doing pretty good since you've seen him last, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to go out and talk with him and just tell him a little bit about what we talked about. And uh, you said you don't have any questions for him or for no. me? Okay. All right. Well, we'll be right back together, okay? All right. Thanks for letting me come talk to you. All right. Nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you, too. We'll be right back. It's important at the conclusion of this part of the interview that the resident does inform the patient that I'm going out to consult with the attending, that we as a team will be back. That provides reassurance that that attending physician is going to be a part of this process. All right, as promised. Hey, Cheryl. Hey, how are, how are you? How are you feeling today? I'm good. You are? I'm good. How are you? Well, I'm doing great. Good. Well, I hear congratulations are in order. How'd you hear about that? He told me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, I, I've got to rein him in a little bit. All right, Jack, go ahead and tell us about what's, uh, what's happened since I saw her last. So she's doing great uh, pretty much since your last visit. Uh, no new changes. Um, she still is a little uh, stiff in the morning, worse in the ankles. Um, but pretty much her days are, are worse just when she uses them a lot. Otherwise, she's pretty much status quo, no new changes. Okay. Yeah, no new complaints either. Let me either. see her med list there, just yeah. to refresh my memory here. Four day of prednisone, ectotrinoscal, methotrexate, folic acid, plaquenil. Okay. Are you stiff in the mornings when you get up? Yeah, just pretty usual, pretty typical. About how long does that take to get as about good as About 30 you minutes, right. yeah. And how about fatigue? I usually can keep going all day. You go all day? Yeah. What are you doing in the summer? You're out. Of, you're not teaching the summer, are you? No. So you're home. What's Sam doing? He's got a couple camps lined up. What kind of camps are you going to? <laughs> Boy Scout camp is one, and the other one is Whippoorwill. It's a day camp. Not That's doing any hy hyper special. Most of these days they have these <laughs> no. you know, computer camps and <laughs> no. uh, pre-dental camps and stuff. No. Let's see your joints here. Today. He's going to enjoy the summer. And How old is he? 12 or something? He'll be 13. Can you believe it? Yeah, you know, you know this is just the beginning. You know. <laughs> kind of gets bad for a while. Is that as much as you can raise that That's, is, that's okay. it. Right, how about this one over here? One of the things that you observe immediately is the fact that there seems to be this long-standing relationship between Dr. Surgeon and the patient. That's one of the great joys of medicine, that there has been this partnership over the years and it allows very effective communication. You see that there is at the appropriate moment uh, an expression of interest in another member of the family that that sort of fosters this notion that I respect you, that I understand that you have a life outside of medicine. And that's going on while a very effective exam is being concluded. And so you see that this provides a nice tool to link people together, to promote a partnership that medicine is supposed to represent. So she's doing great. The resident uh, involved in care uh, had an opportunity to provide the history and description of the physical to the attending physician. Now, this is a technique that has great potential for good or sometimes can create uh, less than an optimal health outcome. I think that uh, if the patient is informed about what's going to occur and that the purpose of this is so that the patient or family actually get to review
the information being transmitted into either agree, disagree, or modify, it can be a wonderful partnership. If the circumstance occurs where the patient is seen really as a non-entity and I'm talking about the patient as though they're really not here in the room, that's not so good. And so it becomes the issue of does the patient have a clear expectation of what's going on? Do they have an opportunity to affirm that the information that's been transmitted is correct? Or if it isn't correct, they have an opportunity to modify it. I think it's also incredibly important to use the patient's name so that there is no question that we are talking about you within this context, but you're a full partner in this discussion. Or can I take the folic acid over the counter? Is that yes, you could. It comes in, it'd be fine. Yeah. Okay. Would you rather do that? Yeah, I mean, that'd be easier, wouldn't it? Yeah, you have to pay for it. You have to pay for it if you order it through this. Well, actually, uh, Dennis has one of those plans where anything we buy in the drugstore, he has like a little account. Okay, it, the, the over-the-counter uh, tablet is four-tenths of a milligram. This is a is one milligram. Okay, so, so I'd have to take. take just take two. Eight tenths is close enough. Okay. Just take, buy it over the counter and take two. And I'll make a note in your record that that's or, that's what we're doing. All right. Anything else today? No, that'd be great. Now we've then. been having you come by and get your lab in three months and let me see you in six. Is that what? Oh yeah, but I didn't come for my three months. Are you kidding? Well, we all take you. We all take you out to the woodshed. <laughs> Um, now I do, just couldn't get here. All right, we'll try to remember, okay? I know. It's, you you I know, know it's important. I, you've done so well. Your lab work over the years has been okay. completely normal, but that's why we do it. One of the things that will occasionally occur in the context of obtaining a history is that we discover that uh, patients sometimes uh, don't do what they said they would do or what we asked them to do. Uh, in this circumstance, uh, uh, Dr. Surgeon does a nice job in a kind way sending the message that, gosh, there is a little disappointment. And the reason there's a little disappointment is because we want the patient to do as well as they can do. And so this kind of gentle first reminder can be a very nice technique. Now, it also is important that that be appropriately documented. I'm going to assume that that's what was being documented so that questions about adherence, that is, the patients uh, following the plan can be followed up on at the time of the next visit. Uh, so sometimes there may need to be other discussions about what barriers exist to why the patient was unable to comply, uh, to adhere with the plan. Lights up. Uh, certainly, <clears throat> sports always a good thing to interact with a patient on. Be careful there, especially if someone doesn't like your team. Uh, just handle that charitably. Sometimes we have a lot of older people that come in and they're sporting hats about their military affiliation. You'll make a buddy for life if you say thank you for your service to our country. It's always a pleasure to take care of a vet. You'll make a buddy for life. Just always keep that in mind. Let's look at one of the audit tools that are available in your packet. I think it's back on 13 or 14. We're actually introducing an audit tool as we've trained everybody now in the medical group, most. Uh, tonight, it'll take it to 900 and something. We've trained the eight at Pathway. So we are empowering the managers to actually do audits to see if this is going to be going on in their work areas because we know that some associates will get on the bus, some associates will go under the bus, some associates will run away from the bus. We, we know that's going to happen. So expect some type of audit about this type of thing in the near future. Remember, the whole idea is that we want to reduce variability. Variability, doing things differently or not doing things with a very competent mindset reduces quality. That's the reason we're doing it. It's also going to be worked into some performance reviews and metrics. So I think I've probably belabored that enough. But this is what I want and this is what the audit tool looks like. You, you have a copy in your packet. But it basically just goes right down through the ADIT framework. You get an opportunity to say, I feel like I'm doing it. Then your supervisor will give you reality. And maybe you need to have a discussion about that. I don't know. Uh, sometimes you'll, you'll get that you've met the competency or haven't and then maybe you need to have some improvement. Don't let this scare you. This is just an opportunity to expand your bag of tricks when it comes to dealing with
communication, and patience, our most important asset. But don't forget, you should be employing these types of principles also with your internal customers. Treat each other nicely. You know, you spend a lot of time with the people at work. You don't want to have bad hair days all the time, bad staff days. You want to have some good days. So this is the exercise I've actually been waiting for. We're going to take about 15 minutes, and then we'll have a little wrap-up at the end. Pick that mean person at your table and assign them to be the staff member. Okay? Somebody else plays patient. Somebody else plays coach. Look at the structured experience on page 11, and I want you to do this in a role play at your table. Once you've done it, switch roles and do it again. 15 minutes. Let me explain to you what the next steps are. And I sincerely thank you for your attendance tonight when we were coordinating how to do this and we decided to pick Friday nights from 4 to 6 p.m. I wish I could share with you some of the emails that I received <laughs> from associates. Two pieces of paper remain in your packet. One is an examination that we are not going to collect tonight. It is very important, however. There is a internet URL at the top of that examination, so as soon as possible, locate a computer, key in these answers and follow the prompts so you can get credit for tonight's attendance. If you signed in but you do not complete the competency, you will not get credit for tonight's attendance. Make sure you can take your test. That's the reason I gave you a copy. I saw people filling it out as I was going. That's fine. I noticed the same thing when I used to teach high school. That is okay and even advisable. So make sure you get to a computer. The passcode is AIDET, A-I-D-E-T. I think I put that on the exam. So make sure that you key that in. It'll be your name. And also make sure you key in your email address correctly. It's supposed to auto-grade and send you your grade, but I see all kinds of weird derivations of emails that people put in there, and they don't get their, res their results, and they wonder why. The second thing is an evaluation form. On your way out the door tonight, please take a moment to give us some comments about this training. Uh, we will read them all, um, so be kind or honest or realistic or whatever. Tell me what you would rather have done on a Friday night. I don't know. We're going to have a few parting comments here in a video form, and then you're going to be dismissed. I can tell you that it's going to be a little hard to get out of the parking lot, so just negotiate that in the spirit of kindness. Remember the principles of ADIT when that person is right on your bumper. Turn around and acknowledge, get off my bumper, but do it in a nice way. Here's some parting comments. Our work around AIDED and, and all of the principles of Elevate are important to us at Vanderbilt because they are a connection between us and the people that we serve, the patients and the families who come to us for care. It means that we are more than connected through technology and science and all of the stuff that medicine brings to the patient encounter these days, but we're connected on a human level. This Elevate opportunity for us is a one that allows us to kind of level the playing field, to make sure that every patient encounter with every physician, every nurse, anyone who meets us at a front desk, anyone who meets us in the hallway or directs us to an elevator is having that same human connection that we would expect even in the most critical of circumstances at the bedside. So it's for consistency. This is great stuff. I really think that this is the passion with which we engage persons who want to work with us at Vanderbilt. It's the passion by which we will engage patients and referring physicians who may want to come to partner with us. Not every outcome here is going to be positive from a clinical standpoint, but every outcome can be positive from that human connection. Whether there's the death of a loved one while in our care, a serious diagnosis that may be disclosed for the first time. Any of those are the human experience that we're going to have in our lives, the people coming to us are going to have in their lives, but it's the way we come to it that will make the difference. Every patient interaction can have a positive experience. With that, 
you are dismissed. Make sure you give your evaluation on your way out the door. Thank you again for your attendance. Thank you.